Well, happening right now in a U.S. federal appeals court, the battle over how to handle the migrant crisis at the Texas-Mexico border. The court is hearing arguments on a controversial state immigration law. The law allows law enforcement in Texas to arrest people suspected of crossing the border into the state illegally, and it gives state judges the power to deport them. Today's hearing will focus on whether the law is constitutional. Now, Donald Trump is making the case that he and only he can fix the immigration crisis in the U.S. Campaigning in the swing state of Michigan on Tuesday, Trump said that the millions of people crossing the border are destroying the country. But I stand before you today to declare that Joe Biden's border bloodbath, and that's what it is. It's a bloodbath. They tried to use that term incorrectly on me two weeks ago. You know, it's all about misinformation. That's all they do is cheat on elections and disinformation, misinformation, fairly closely related, those two words. But they basically mean that uh, it's all talk, but it's a border bloodbath, and it's destroying our country. It's a very bad thing happening. Now, immigration isn't the only contentious issue in the race for the White House. Abortion is also expected to be a major factor for many voters this November. The Florida Supreme Court brought the issue back to the forefront this week, delivering a ruling that paves the way for a six-week abortion ban to take effect in the state. Now, of course, the precursor to restrictive abortion bans, like the ones in Florida, was the fall of Roe versus Wade. And Trump can claim some responsibility for that. But is that an asset or is it a liability? CNN senior political reporter Stephen Collinson has just written about that in his latest piece. He joins me now. Stephen, good to have you. You write in the piece that Hi. his equivocating shows that he knows restrictive abortion policies are deeply unpopular and could weaken his already fragile appeal to suburban and women voters. But he can't quite disown his big win in becoming the Republican president who sent Roe versus Wade crashing down. Stephen, as you lay it, I mean, as you lay out there, it creates quite the political dilemma for Trump. Right. And I think the uh, rather fuzzy statements that Trump has been making show that he really understands that this could be a big issue in the election. Democrats are trying to make it the issue in a lot of these swing states because uh, overturning Roe v. Wade was very unpopular in those areas. And, and Trump is trying to have it both ways. Uh, the building of the conservative Supreme Court majority was one of the greatest achievements by any Republican president in the modern age. So, of course, he wants uh, credit for that. And it's been a glue that's helped him with uh, Republican voters in the primary race and is one of the reasons why he was able to win so quickly. But in the more moderate uh, electorate that we see in general elections in states which are going to be decided by a few thousand votes, this could be a very difficult issue. So he's struggling to come up with uh, a solution as the Biden campaign tries to pin him down. Yeah, I mean, to that point, I mean, the Biden campaign is trying to pounce on this and not just in the presidential election, but Democrats perhaps hoping that this might even um, get them a Senate seat in Florida. Right. And I think that is uh, quite a big danger for Republicans. While Florida in recent elections has been trending towards Republicans, uh, and you could argue that Trump's uh, rather equivocating position on abortion might help him out. Further down the ticket, uh, there is a very competitive Senate race. Rick Scott, the incumbent, uh, only won by less than 1% uh, six years ago. If there is even a small shift against him because of abortion, and he is quite a hardline conservative on abortion, his seat could uh, be in danger. This is really significant because Democrats are defending a lot of uh, vulnerable seats themselves in the Senate. Most people think what's most likely to happen is that Democrats lose control to the Senate. So if they can put uh, one or two seats on the table, which probably weren't going to be competitive, uh, that's going to help them. And the fact that this abortion uh, constitutional amendment is now going to be on the ballot gives them a lot of hope that if they can't necessarily get to the 60 percent they need uh, to, to enshrine abortion rights in Florida law, they will get so much turnout from Democratic and moderate voters that they could put that Senate seat in play. Yeah, uh, Senator Rick Scott's challenger saying that this decision um, out of the Florida courts there was a, a game changer. Um, Stephen, let me ask, you know, Democrats are sort of banking on this being a real mobilizing issue. Um, but do they run the risk of overplaying their hand here? And what I mean is that there are other issues that um, seem to be 
at the very least as important to certain groups. You think about immigration, you think about the economy. There are many issues right now that voters care about. Are Democrats perhaps running, their, running the risk of uh, overplaying things right here? What, what do you think? I think that uh, you have to kind of uh, fight the election that's in front of you, if you see what I mean. Uh, if you look at polls, abortion is one of the very few issues on which uh, President Joe Biden polls better uh, than former President Donald Trump on issues like immigration, the economy, even foreign policy. Uh, Trump tends to do better than the president. So obviously Biden has to uh, bring those numbers uh, into a little bit more uh, equal balance. He has to address the issue of the economy. Uh, he has been trying to defuse uh, Trump's advantage on immigration by being willing to accept some uh, rather harsh border measures of his own. And Biden, of course, has another problem. He's got this issue of the Democratic coalition that helped him win in 2020 not being that engaged. There's been a fall off among uh, black male voters, for example. Uh, a lot of progressives uh, are very upset about the way he's handled the is Israel's war in Gaza uh, and the toll uh, of casualties among Palestinians. So Biden has an awful lot of problems. I think one reason why Democrats are uh, interested in, in pushing abortion so much is it's one of the few areas where they have an advantage. Mm, yeah, super, super interesting. Uh, Stephen Collinson, it was a great piece. We appreciate you coming on today. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks. All right, let's discuss this more. I want to bring in today's political panel. Joining me now is Republican strategist Rena Shah and former special assistant to President Biden, Megan Hayes. Good to see you both, ladies. Megan, let me start with you um, and pick up where Stephen left off there saying, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, that Biden has a lot of issues, but it doesn't appear that abortion or reproductive rights will be one of them. But in terms of Florida, do you think Democrats are sort of overplaying how mobilizing this issue could be? What do you think? No, I don't think so. I think it's shown in the midterms and in some of these special elections that Democrats have overperformed um, with the issue of abortion. Also, the, Joe Biden has an extreme advantage with the amount of cash on hand that he has that puts Florida back in play. I think it's a really big opportunity to pick up voters, but it also picks up momentum for him going into some of these other swing states. And then, Rena, to that point, I mean, uh, Megan just mentioned sort of uh, Biden's financial advantage. Trump does not have that advantage, not yet, at least. How much of a, of a challenge does this create for him, whereas he might have to start dedicating some resources to Florida, a state where perhaps maybe a month or two ago you would think would go red? It went for him the last two presidential elections. So how much of this creates a challenge for Trump? Not only is uh, Trump and the RNC going to have to dedicate some resources to Florida, they're going to have to d dedicate way more than they expected to. It's a very expensive state to play in, and every dollar spent there is a dollar not spent elsewhere to do the work that's needed in swing states to turn out your voters. So Republicans have a major problem on their hands, not just the Florida Republican Party itself, which is going to have to deal with districts that are swingy, that are going to become even swingier, uh, but national Republicans now are going to see exactly the same type of life-saving uh, methods that the Republican Governors Association used for Ron DeSantis to just sort of run up the score for him there. One out of every four dollars was spent in Florida by the Republican Governors Association, again, for DeSantis. So this is a really terrible moment because uh, not only is the RNC and Trump deficient in, in cash, they're going to have to redirect that cash. And there are going to be states that are mad and they're going to be national re level Republicans who are going to be sounding the alarm. Rita, let me stick with you for a moment more. So Trump once called a six-week ban a terrible idea. Yesterday, on the back of these rulings out of Florida, um, Trump declined to answer questions on the matter. He said he's going to issue a statement next week. How does he thread the needle here? I mean, is that even possible on this issue? At this point, it's really hard to see how Trump can at all uh, really take an about face on this issue and, and start to do well on messaging about it. I mean, save for Nikki Haley, who at the national level leadership of Republicans, whether congressional or anywhere, anywhere else, has properly talked about abortion in an empathetic way, in a way that, as Nikki Haley put it, humanized the issue instead of demonized women. I haven't heard it. And, and you don't even hear too much of that practical argument of, hey, look, the overturn of Roe, all it meant was that we wanted to kick it back to states to determine what was best for their people. You hear that every now and then, but the fuzzy messaging for Trump is really a shot in the foot for him. I don't know what he could say now to really instill faith in, again, that independently minded voter in a swing state that he's the right person to not enact a federal ban if he wins office again. 
Megan, let me ask, if you're on the Biden campaign and you're waking up this morning, you're looking at the results from some of these primary states where um, this protest vote continues to be there and state after state, you're looking at this Wall Street Journal reporting that suggests in these battleground states, it is an extremely close race. What is what is the loudest warning sign that you are if you were looking at this morning, looking at these two sort of um, events and, and what does the Biden campaign do with this? Look, I mean, these are all within the margin of error. I think that the president needs to stick his course. He needs to stick to his messaging. He needs to continue to draw the contrast between him and Donald Trump. There's a lot of freedoms that are being, you know, that Donald Trump would like to take away from people, and he needs, and the president needs to run on how he wants to protect people's freedoms, whether it be abortion or, or other different rights. So I think that where these are, you know, these polls are concerning. You can't live and die by the polls, especially a poll that comes out in March. We're seven months away from the election. Um, you know, it's you take note, but it's also these are all within the margin of error, and the president, the no, the election in November is a long ways away. And like the fact of the matter is, 95% of the people have already made up their mind of where they're going to vote. So, and the other 5% probably aren't paying attention till late September, early October. So these polls, you know, where they're they're here, but they're they're not something to we don't need to live and die by them.